So I'll start out with the Google search. Uh, that's something like uh, how many mammal species are there on Earth. And I did this at some point before. It's actually a pretty precise number uh, that you can get. Uh, when you modify that to say, for example, uh, how many insect species are there in Arizona, uh, there's some sort of threshold where it, it fizzles. <laughs> okay, so Google is searching for for some web page, um, um, 455 is, 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 is not right as we'll see. Um, let's modify that even further. I'm sort of drilling down in a rather idiosyncratic way. It just occurred to me. So our uh, ASU insect collection actually has a really nice um, sampling of, of Arizona-based cicada species. Um, It's close to about four dozen species, it says right here. There's a uh, curator uh, from the University of Arizona Tucson based collection who says uh, there's uh, 36 species. Um, but um, um, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of like see uh, what that actually means. Um, so I sort of just went through uh, these few steps and uh, now making a, a segue uh, towards a, a data portal. Uh, that's provided uh, by um, uh, insect collections that are largely uh, US based. Uh, so this particular data portal is called SCAN. And I sort of have to go back and forth here uh, to see what I want to do. I think the first thing that I'm supposed to be doing is just a search for Arizona cicada species. So there's a search option here, search uh, collections. Um, and uh, what you can see here first is that this is a data portal that actually hosts sources from, from multiple uh, institutions, um, some of which may even be governmental, but, but certainly different academic institutions that have a certain regional affiliation. And they also have a, 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 a taxonomic constraint, meaning uh, that they are hosting um, uh, invertebrate or arthropod data uh, primarily, right? So I can sort of deselect any or all of them or select them and I can go to a, a search frame and now I need to know something about cicadas in, 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 in a technical language. Uh, it's the family Cicadidae uh, and I can see uh, Arizona right here. And I do a search and I get uh, this um, uh, recording back. Um, the way these data are recorded are at the level of an individual organism or specimen or, or voucher. And so I'm actually learning here that there's 5,882 uh, vouchers of Arizona-based cicadas in multiple collections. Some of them are from Brigham Young, uh, which is Utah. Uh, there's a, a project actually that provided some of these data. So I can sort of like go through the project has a lot of data. I've got to go all the way to the back. Uh, then I see a species list right here, and the answer is 78. So I had sort of like 48 or 36, uh, and there's 78 here. Um, but uh, there's actually a bit of a caveat, and you, so you see these Latin names here, uh, that these are the, the raw data, um, which means that there are data where the names come from the sources the way they are labeled by the different sources, right? And so that could potentially be uh, including uh, non-congruent usages of, of certain labels uh, in, in a sense of a scientific or taxonomic perspective, right? And there are some um, homogenizing uh, options here where the name that is used as raw in the sauce could be mapped through some name relationships uh, uh, to uh, what is here called the default taxonomic thesaurus. And so then we see that um, the number changes to 68. Um, and there's another alternative uh, taxonomic thesaurus and uh, the number changes to uh, 54, right? Um, I guess that speaks somehow to design. 
some, somebody here in the design uh, uh, considered that uh, there can be multiple perspectives accommodated by the design in general, if and to the extent that they exist sort of like in the scientific community. Um, let me go back to my search criteria. So if I expand this out, uh, my previous uh, question was, you know, how many insects are there in Arizona? How many insect species? So I got to go up and I put in insecta. The search might take a little longer, actually not that long. And I got uh, a little over half a million insect records and a species list that will take a while, uh, but it's going to, once I decide to homogenize it, uh, add up to I think about 17,000 is what I had yesterday. Okay, so 17,000 specimen-based recordings of species for the state of Arizona according to this particular source, uh, compared to 5,416 mammal species according to Google. Uh, it gives you a little bit of a perspective. Um, so now let me see what I can do, because I had said that you know ASU has like a nice cicada collection. Let's repeat this for the cicadas. I hope this is not way too small. So if I'm not really looking there, let's make it a little bigger. Um, so I go back to cicada theme here. Oh, we actually haven't databased them yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. We have about 10% of, uh, of our collection database currently, right? And the cicadas haven't gotten any funding yet. <laughs> um, there's another way that I can look at these data, however. Um, uh, some searches are sort of map-based searches. And, and earlier, I think it was um, the first speaker, right? Uh, uh, he had some, uh, Eric, right, yeah. He had um, some vertebrates uh, east of, uh, of Florence, and I quickly went to a portal and I checked how many vertebrate records we have east of Florence. But um, one, one search that's kind of illustrative is um, if you uh, go into the uh, southeastern uh, corner of Arizona, the so-called Chiricahua Mountains, uh, and you, you, you can put like a, a frame above that region and um, you can say, show me all the ants. And so the little bit of background here is that uh, there's a station in Portal. It's a tiny little research station, but they've held ant identification training courses. And so it's a relatively well sampled region for ant species um, because of this historical, uh, you know, sort of like, like training element. Um, you can probably also see under the surface that um, I happen to be logged in to this portal, but I don't have to be, right? And I'm doing all of my searches live. Uh, there's, there's nothing under the hood other than what my hands and my, my head are doing. Um, and, and so here are my, my hands, uh, and I can sort of like see that they come from these different collections. These are uh, total of 9,311 ant records. And again, they correspond to a certain uh, species diversity. And uh, I can sort of like auto color that uh, to visualize that, right? So that could have potentially, <laughs> when um, Eric was mentioning the mussels and the bat, and he had like a, a map of some little uh, a Pennsylvania town, uh, I, I was thinking of this just because it, it's close to home. And um, you can also see that, you know, uh, ant biologists, sometimes they just park a car and, <laughs> and collect very close to where the car is, <laughs> uh, right? Um, but there's a, again, there's sort of like, a, there's a certain data culture uh, that, that is, uh, uh, I think, implicit and, and, and even a certain maybe research or science culture, right? So you can also take these records from this live search and you can download them uh, in a certain format, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, again, this may take a little while. It's saying it's waiting. 
uh, but it'll spit out a, uh, a spreadsheet uh, with, with a, a comma separated uh, data file of these 9,311 records that you could potentially pipe into some other visualization or analysis tool, right? Um, uh, the portal as a whole uh, currently has, I don't actually know, sort of waiting for this to, to happen. Um, let me see. And sometimes I'm capable of, of like crashing it. So let's, let's, let's hold on to that thought. Um, I, I will show you the, the spreadsheet in a bit. Uh, the portal as a whole has something like um, 18 million records currently, uh, right? Uh, is this still coming? Yeah, we just have to wait. That's fine. Meanwhile, I can go somewhere else. Just give you a different perspective. I, said that this was a, an arthropod data portal. Um, here's a portal that uses similar software. Uh, you can sort of see the look and feel. Uh, that's probably just one content management system that has like a different skin on it, uh, right? Uh, but it's for plants and it's, it's uh, originated um, essentially here at ASU and, and, and the University of, uh, of Arizona. Uh, and so uh, there's um, some other things that you can uh, do that are kind of neat. Um, let me see what I wanted to do. Oh yeah, here. Uh, they have a, a dynamic key function where you don't necessarily uh, draw a frame, even though you can, but instead you can just sort of plant a little flag somewhere. And uh, where I'm going is uh, the McDowell Mountains. I find them. First, I gotta find Hinkin Kepler Grand. Yeah, I'm going to the McDowell Mountain Range, and I'm planting my flag you know, pretty much smack in the middle of them. And uh, I'm looking for species from the sunflower or daisy family. Right. So the search that I've just configured is uh, take either this point or maybe some reasonable radius around it and find me all of the individual plant records of the sunflower family that are in this portal, which has, I think, 2.5 million or so. Um, I'll do this again. Um, records, okay? And so I get back a species count of um, 187 uh, within, that translates into 20 miles. Um, uh, but there's actually also an identification key, uh, which is kind of interesting. If you have your sunflower species in front of you and you happen to crack a leaf away and it has uh, some milky substance, uh, you could check that here and then you're down to 19 from 187. And then maybe it's flowering right now in November. That would be not super common, but you're down to three, right? And you can look at each of those uh, sort of like on a species page. Uh, there are multiple taxonomic descriptions. Uh, there are some uh, photos that were you know, shot sort of like in the wild. We call them observations in, 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 in this framework. Uh, but there's um, a lot of data that's sort of under the hood that are actually uh, scanned in herbarium sheets, right? So you think of cabinets with drawers and folders and, and, and each of them uh, is, is a sheet and you can see that they again come from uh, like a number of um, different collections depending on uh, if you look at one individual one this happens to be from the University of Texas herbarium and the next one is from the uh, University of Arizona herbarium so they're all scanned in and jointly uh, these records actually constitute this distribution map. Uh, and there, there used to be sort of like a history of making these maps, but essentially hand drawing them, right? And there's also a history, of course, of, of niche modeling uh, uh, based on this. But in this particular case, uh, 
data density or data availability is such that you may actually be hard pressed to find the species here, right? It, it, it may may not be an artifact, quote unquote, of of, of lack of trying, right? So so this um, I guess somehow speaks to maybe data decisiveness or, or data signal availability, and 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 then there's the actual signal sort of content. What does it say? Um, did I ever get my download? No. I'm gonna do this again because I kind of know that it works if I try. Um, so I, I want to do my little ant search one more time. Or maybe just show you something like this is actually a, not a dynamic search, but it is a, what biologists call a checklist. Uh, it's sort of like filtered by, by an editor, by an expert. Um, it can be done collaboratively. Uh, what the expert does here is, is basically, uh, he or she sort of draws upon the entire data body and then says, well, I want to let have certain records flow into this checklist because I feel like they're, they're sort of like adequate for this. And so this happens to be a, a checklist of the species of weevils for the Mexican state of Sonora. Uh, there are more potentially eligible, eligible uh, species in the data portal, but, but this is sort of like the subset that, that I happen to let in. And so again, you can sort of like look at this map so that's, that's kind of like a canned or, or a, a hardwired query um, that, that, that's really a database. Um, and you can download these records here. It's a little bit fewer records, but so this is the analogy to what I did with the, with the live ant search. And hopefully it's doing it this time. <laughs> I'm gonna wait out a little bit. Yes, great, thank you. So it's gonna save it here. And so I get this uh, little zip file and I can unzip it. And um, the main file that I'm looking at right now here is the occurrences. There's slightly over 2,000 in this particular data set. And I just wanted to show you what, what, what this looks like. Uh, so there's a uh, some sort of database ID here. There's an institutional code. What kind of specimen is it? There's like a 32-bit globally unique identifier that's associated with that, that specimen. Uh, some taxonomic information. Uh, who identified it? Uh, when was it identified? Which taxonomic resource did that person use in order to identify it? Uh, who collected it? Uh, when was it collected? Um, uh, are there additional natural history data associated with it? Um, and then, you know, geographic information uh, all the way down to the, uh, the latitude and longitude, which allows the machine sort of like to, to put it on a, on a map, right? And so again, this, this could potentially be piped into another analysis or, 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 or um, um, workflow in, in order to um, present a step in some sort of uh, design or, or decision uh, or, or, or data workflow uh, chain. Okay, what else did I want to share? Um, I think I'm good here. Um, so stepping back a bit, uh, how did this come about? Um, I think natural history collections probably started the first database efforts of any kind sometime maybe in the mid or even early 70s. Uh, Sometime, it, and it started with the herbaria, uh, I believe. Uh, the insect collections were sort of historically late. Uh, um, and I think by the time the 1980s came around, and, and again, this is largely a, a European and maybe North American uh, um, sort of scientific history, um, associations were formed uh, that uh, spoke um, to this biodiversity informatics movement. Um, there's one in particular that's called, uh, used to be called TEDWIC, Taxonomic Database Working Group, uh, and uh, they now are called Biodiversity Information Standards, or something like that. Um, and um, one of the uh, 
main outcomes, I think, of, of that effort um, uh, is this um, standard called Darwin Core. And so everything that I've showed you right now in terms of accessing this, this collection information and, and, and doing the searches uh, comes down to it, it's, it's in this format that enough of the community has bought into for the time being uh, so that you can have these uh, multi-collection, uh, multi-taxonomic group, multi-regional um, um, cross-links and, 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 and services added on top. Uh, so, so, so Darwin Core is, uh, it's not super complicated. It's, it's a, a reasonably common enough language about, uh, you know, what is it, who identified it, where was it, when was it collected, what kind of sample is it, some higher level stuff, right? And there's a, a more detailed terminology that quite frankly, even as a non-specialist, uh, I think uh, you can, uh, you know, so this is basically Darwin Core, this is the standard, right? Uh, and it's somewhat interesting from the design perspective, uh, you know, the, the standard provides kind of like the language, but then best practices and, and shared practices are, you know, not regulated by the standard in and of itself, you know? One of the things I showed you here is that um, when, when I use Darwin Core, um, uh, I, I sort of say, you know, hey, it's me, Nico, who identified this specimen, uh, not just who collected it, but, uh, you know, I identified it, and I identified it on May 9th, 2017, and I used uh, this reference, right? That's not something that Darwin Core forces me to do, it's something that Darwin Core allows me to do, but uh, it's the, the reason why I personally do it is because I'm sort of using the platform to promote individual taxonomic voices as much as the platform allows. Um, the, the reason why I do that has to do with, um, um, there, there's um, something else that can happen uh, here uh, that I'm actually gonna lead up next. So the Starving Core has then also allowed something uh, that, that one might call meta-aggregation. And I don't have a fancy slide there, but, but you can, if you know something about how scientists operate and, and how science funding operate, you can sort of also look at, uh, at, at this history of this biodiversity informatics as a history of relatively short-term grant-funded projects that did a lot of branding and sort of said, hey, we're the new centralized so-and-so hub for everything. And then as time progresses, they sort of like wander to the periphery of the slide and some new project goes into the center of the slide. And yeah, we're connecting to these, but we're really the new hub and so forth. And then they move to the side, right? And, and so, um, so, so I don't have that slide, that slide exists, but I, it's not mine, where, where you just have all of these branded projects and they have uh, different funding agencies, different regions, different taxonomic groups, and different other initiatives uh, sort of uh, lifting them up for a while and then, and then potentially uh, uh, dropping them, right? So let me, um, the portals that I've showed you are actually sustained um, by, by a content management system. Uh, that's that's not, a, not a financial model, but it's, it's sort of like an informatics model uh, called, called Symbiota. And so Symbiota currently sustains, so, so Symbiota is kind of the, the skin that you see here, this stuff. There's a database underneath, uh, but, but, but Symbiota is the, it's like Drupal or something like that, like, like a content management system, right? Um, and so it, uh, it currently supports in North America, but it really goes beyond, you know, these different kinds of collections. And um, one of the interesting design features here is that if you read the names of the different portals, so it's, it's it's not a, um, it, it's like a low to mid-level aggregator in the sense that it sort of promotes, and I don't know whether that's only design or, and or also culture, I think it's a mix of both. Uh, if you read these titles, so there's like a portal on the channel islands. So I translate it into anything that's an organism that's in that region, right? But there's a regional constraint. Uh, 
Most of the portals have both the regional constraints you see here in North America or Mexico and Central America or the da da da, da Austral Americano um, and a taxonomic constraint, right? Invert eBase would mean invertebrates, you know, so that's not all. None of these, I believe, deal with like algae from Japan currently, right? <laughs> so a, a, as an example. And so, um, so our insect collection, now I gotta go back to scan. Here, has a life uh, with some, you know, 96K occurrences using the Darwin core standard um, in this relatively low level aggregator portal. But um, there's also been significant funding over the last 10 years by a biodiversity data hub funded by the National Science Foundation called IDIC Bio. And so you can see they have some maybe 15, 115 million records right here. Uh, you can search them as well. So they are sort of like one level up, uh, like a continental or subcontinental, but effectively NSF funded, <laughs> and therefore also sort of NSF relevant uh, meta aggregator. Uh, and our collection um, that I just showed you also has a life with IDIC Bio then, uh, by virtue of, and if you compare the number of records, now I gotta really jump, uh, you see where here, this is like the truth. <laughs> it's like the now, we're at 96,883 records that we've databased. Uh, IDIC Bio is uh, not far behind, maybe by 250 records or so. What they do is uh, periodically, I believe every two weeks, there's, a, there's an API service, an, an automated service that harvests um, what we have. That is because Symbiota allows you to set it up that way, that you can expose yourself. Uh, so it's kind of like there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a gate at IDIC Bio that can be opened because it's programmed that way and there's a gate at the Symbiota database level node because it's been opened that way. And so then uh, it just happens automatically, quote unquote, after all of the social and the technical processes have, set, have been set up, right? At the global level, there's something called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, probably the longest funded and most visible global aggregator of, of these records, and they recently celebrated that you know they have over a billion now. I think a good two thirds of that are bird observations. Uh, it's, 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 it's heavily uh, sort of influenced by, by the bird enthusiast or an ornithological enthusiast community. Um, and uh, again, uh, we, we have a life there uh, with our collection, uh, which is actually up to date, probably because on the same date I was talking to somebody else and I updated it, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that actually has to happen manually. I have to go into Symbiota here and uh, I have to sort of like say Darwin Core Archive Publishing and I have to kick it out to GBIF, yeah, create, refresh, and, and, and sort of like create it. But again, it's, it's a couple of mouse clicks and then the data have been pushed there, right? But you can see how, again, from a design perspective, um, this has been really interesting, I think, for the field and I think it's under-recognized. Um, I've already mentioned before that locally people use different taxonomies. Uh, so what's the global taxonomy? Right? Is there one? Um, we're creating these versions because we have a standard that allows us to push data around in, 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 in big chunks. But we haven't really made a whole lot of investment so far into just versioning accountability. Uh, the expressing the delta between two versions is not something that you know has been particularly prevalent or so. And that may mean something for uh, the um, um, you know design and, and, and some of the social uh, implications if uh, if there's a standard that can sort of like lead to meta aggregation, but in the course of doing that, you might lose some of the connectivity, uh, then um, that's, that's at least 
noteworthy, I think. Um, so I had here some final notes, and I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm, that I'm probably short on time. Uh, there's sort of like this issue of decentralization versus centralization, when historically, I think centralization has been the gold standard, or, or has been just where people have sort of been drawn to fairly naturally. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, good quality control, uh, however, tends to push towards decentralization. Uh, as an expert, or so designated for Arizona insects, uh, or for Arizona weevils or so, I actually feel most comfortable providing data quality control in, in the software and in the environment that's closest to home, right? Which, which happens to be this one where we live manage our data as opposed to these periodic sna snapshots, right? So the uh, good quality control would push towards distribution, but in order to get that global coverage, you know, you want centralization. And, and, and there's, I think, an open question in our field what, what the right technological, sociological, and also economic pathways are uh, in that context, and, and what roles the standard play and, 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 and don't play, and should play and shouldn't play, and what about extra standard practices, right? Completely different question is what are we actually learning from these um, uh, natural history collections data now online? And um, so there's an increasing number of publications. There was just a, uh, an edited volume that's coming out in January, but it's already online, on uh, biological collections for understanding biodiversity in the Anthropocene, like the, the time that we live in right now that's influencing um, um, you know, uh, the, the Earth, I guess, and, 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 uh, and so forth. Um, it's not an easy question. Uh, but I think my, my, my own personal uh, currently emerging thought is that um, what we're learning from these data scientifically increasingly is that um, be more of a fit between the question and the sampling approach than um, we sometimes might like. Uh, uh, Oftentimes, when we have uh, visitors into our natural history collections, which, by the way, you know, our spaces physically look kind of like this, um, there's sort of the question: Why do you have so many? Why do you keep on collecting? You know, why do you need that many? Uh, but for a lot of questions that you know happen to be relevant to the current evolution of of, of habitat use and so forth, uh, the answer is probably that um, we don't have enough of the common species regularly from enough places in order to actually answer a lot of the questions that we would like to answer. And that is because I think historically there has been some tendency by the folks who are living and making these natural history collections to try to max out the number of different kinds of organisms in as many different places as we can reach but once you have something, once you understand that it's pretty common and you happen to go back there two years ago, you might actually not collect that thistle again or that pine tree again or, or, or that you know, common ladybug again and so forth. And so um, the uh, sort of maybe promise or, or expectations that you can utilize these natural history data without some seriously informed uh, you know, inferential cherry picking, uh, I think would be a naive uh, assumption, yeah? And, and so I think a lot of the papers that you see that are coming out of these natural history collections and they do provide signal of some sense um, is because there was some serious, you know, inferential cherry picking going on because a lot of the other data might not be decisive enough in order to answer whatever particular question you have because they weren't necessarily collected for a purpose that's close enough to, to that question, right? Um, one of the things um, that I think that perhaps emerging conclusion is actually stimulating is more top-down sampling. Possibly of fewer organisms, but, but more structured, right? And so um, a, a real eye-opener um, for me was this 
this ridiculously dogged study of, of collecting insects uh, with, with some automated traps that, that look like this, and they collect largely like flies and wasps. It's like a tent where, where they fly in, they hit it, and then they land in an alcohol jar. That was carried out for 27 years in um, certain areas in Germany, of all places, and um, found out that the biomass of the insects decreased by three quarters. Um, and I think the interesting part here was that um, two twofold. A, we know a lot about German natural history, just because there's a lot of enthusiasts, a lot of natural historians, a lot of biology. It's a, it's a relatively well educated and very densely populated country. It's not clear to me that any other animal group uh, or, or organism group or, or environmental data was, was actually showing that signal. Okay, so, so you, I'm not sure that you could necessarily have gotten this from bird counts or, or from plant coverage counts and, and so forth, but it's a, it's, it's a pretty dramatic signal, right? And there was, uh, I think just two days ago, uh, a follow-up article uh, in the New York Times that admittedly I didn't read, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it speaks to this idea that um, sort of these long-term, top-down, rather dogged approaches to sampling that are not terribly uh, familiar to the culture of natural history collection may actually be necessary in order to extract some of these signals that we're expecting to, to get in order to use you know, primary biodiversity data 